Hello, and thanks for joining us for today's webinar titled Microsoft Azure in Continuity, Five Use Cases, Five Success Factors. I'm Kevin Collins from Unitrends, and I'm here with Joe Noonan, Vice President of Product Marketing, and he'll be taking us through the presentation today. And don't forget, one lucky attendee will be walking away with a $100 Amazon gift card. We'll contact the winner via email after the webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. This session will be recorded, and after the event, you'll receive an email with a link to the on-demand version of the webinar, as well as some additional resources. I would also encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. You can do so by typing them into the Q&A box in the right-hand corner of the player. We'll answer your questions at the end of the session. At this point, I'll turn it over to Joe. Enjoy the presentation, and Joe, take it away. Great, thanks, Kevin. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Hopefully, you get some uh, some valuable information here for folks that are you know starting to really try to understand you know what's going on with Microsoft Azure and how you can leverage it from a backup and business continuity perspective. So um, let's just get right into it here. So I, I do like to set the stage a little bit with a lot of these presentations, right? And and I think one of the key things that a lot of you all are feeling in IT um, is that kind of your, your job can really suck a lot of times because when you look at how fast technology is changing and from, from physical environments to virtual and now having to deal with cloud, you have a million other ways that the, the environment is changing both on-premise and elsewhere, lots of vendors throwing information at you. Um, it creates a lot of confusion and ultimately it creates growth that far outpaces the people that implement and manage it. And that's kind of what you see here. That gray line, that flat, that's the growth in IT professionals in comparison to a lot of the other aspects of the environment that you have to deal with. And that's that's obviously something that screams for simplicity. And, and it definitely doesn't help that you have things like ransomware um, as one example popping up and threatening things left and right. I mean, this is like a serious risk to, to organizations these days. I mean, more than, more than about 60% of businesses have been impacted by ransomware. And what's really interesting is that 63% of those that have been hit by it have actually been down more than a day, right? And, and that's, a, that's a pretty big killer. Delta is a really good example of what Delta downtime can look like, $150 million for a single outage. And then, of course, average cost of a single data center outage across the country uh, in North America, 730,000. These are real business impacts. So I'm glad we're here today and, and taking some time to, to talk through, you know, some of the things that we have to offer around different use cases, ways to leverage Azure, depending on where you are um, in your whole, you know, stage of, of cloud adoption, and even just where you are in terms of adding more resilience to your environment. And I think folks that are starting to adopt cloud are, are kind of ahead of the game, really, uh, especially folks that never really were able to, to have a secondary site, whether it was budget or, or just simply manpower related. Um, you know, folks suffering with significant pain from managing that secondary site, even if you do have one, uh, you can kind of see the, you know, the important list of triggers here that really help uh, build a lot of the use cases and the demand for cloud-based backup and continuity. And we see a lot of this every day at Unitrends in our customer base. Folks would love to be doing more, and they just don't always have the time or, or the budget or the capabilities. And I think cloud and, and what we're trying to do here with partners like Microsoft with Azure are really trying to help kind of head that off and, and give people solutions they never really thought they could have before um, based on, you know, what they're dealing with right now in terms of headcount and, and budget and all that stuff. And I think, you know, the adoption numbers are really there to, to, to kind of prove this out, especially when you look at DR as a service. This is a view of the worldwide market from 2015 to 2012, um, 2020. You can see here growth, the, the smallest growth is actually in North America because there's quite a bit of adoption there. But growth is, is up around the 60 percent in, in most of the world around DR as a service for, for clouds. And the nice thing about that, let's just benchmark this for a second. When you think about the backup software market, as, as Gartner defines it, that's actually only growing 5.5%. So it just kind of gives you an idea of, of where the adoption and where folks are starting to put their money uh, when it comes to you know, business continuity, disaster recovery, backup, things like that. And, and the cloud's a great vehicle for that. Um, digging into that market a little bit more, when you look at the different types of solutions that help drive you know, those overall figures, Backup is a big part of it, 
people are leveraging backup as kind of the catalyst for DR as a service uh, very often. And typically what that really means in that particular category on the left is that folks are basically leveraging a backup product to do on-premise data protection and then sending replicated data out to a cloud provider to handle some form of DR capability. And uh, the real-time replication one, this is really not real-time replication the way that I think we all would think of it. We think of real-time replication as something that's synchronous where, you know, a write's not really finished until it's on both sides. That's not what this actually means when you dig into for the particular source of the report. They're just talking about direct replication, something that basically takes a, a physical machine or a virtual machine image and just immediately sends it to um, a cloud provider for DR capabilities. So we're not talking about anything that involves a local backup or anything like that. Um, and the good thing here is, you know, by the end of the presentation, I'll, I'll give you some, some advice and some information about, you know, how Unitrans has products that ultimately live in, in both of those key spaces. Now, why Azure? Um, I think a lot of folks here probably are already very interested in Azure. Um, and, you know, this is not going to be an in-depth comparison of Azure and AWS and other folks, but just wanted to give you a little bit of an idea of, of why Microsoft Azure is pretty important to, to Unitrans, and, and one of it is, it's because our customer base is saying it is. Um, what you see on the left here is actually a survey that we've done with our very large uh, 15,000 plus customer base. And it's come back and shown that, you know, obviously Amazon is a huge gorilla in the cloud market. Folks are actually starting to leverage Azure even more just by a smidge there, but it actually is more than AWS in that base. And RightScale has done a really nice state of the cloud report that shows that folks that are starting to experiment and plan to use particular cloud uh, offerings are looking at Azure more. And, and that's pretty interesting. So demand drives interest from vendors in a big way, and, and we're absolutely seeing, you know, demand in the Microsoft Azure place. Now, one of the things that, and, and by the way, I think Microsoft does a great job detailing out a lot of its differentiation on the website, so I recommend you go check that out. Uh, I'll give you some of the, the big hitters that our customers are telling me. And, and one of them is the Azure Marketplace. Um, Amazon does have a similar marketplace, but the things that I really like about the Azure Marketplace and what Microsoft's done is that um, the information in the user experience is, is much, much stronger uh, with Microsoft, I, I believe. And, and ultimately, <clears throat> it's very geared towards partners. You'll actually see a lot of mainstream vendors in the backup space in the Azure markets, uh, marketplace versus in the AWS marketplace. And that's really just kind of a, a testament to how Microsoft works with its partners. And, and that's good for all of you on the, the customer side because you'll have options and you ultimately have, you know, people developing and innovating when you have a platform that really serves, you know, the partner community very well. It allows us to deliver great solutions that are premium for you. And I think that's actually one of the things that I think Microsoft gets uh, a little bit of kudos for, for really putting that in place and, and behaving in that fashion because it's really how they behave with the community. Another piece is, is really about availability. Um, the Azure regions, right now I believe they're, they've announced 38 data centers. I could be out of date on that because they, they seem to be happening so frequently. But they have more data centers announced right now than AWS and Google combined. And really what that means for you is that it's pretty much easy to access no matter where you are. And of course, they're very well trusted. Uh, it, it, they're a giant vendor in the space. Um, they have just about every certification out there. And, and that's obviously something that's pretty important when it comes to cloud because people know that they're giving up some control and understanding that, you know, you're in good chance and you can be trusted and things are secure and there's proof around that through these certifications I think is, is a big help. So let's talk a little bit about how you might use it. All right, so five use cases that we're actually uh, going to cover here related to backup and continuity uh, are going to be cloud migration, where a lot of folks are now starting to think about moving workloads from on-premise into the cloud. There's got to be a process to do that. And Azure is a good place to actually make that move to. Disaster recovery is a huge one. You know, a lot of folks that aren't ready to actually run production in the cloud are starting to do so through DR processes so that if their primary site goes down, they can leverage the cloud. Big, big hitter in, in the space, especially when we talked about those pain points earlier. Someone might be, you know, lacking a secondary site or just struggling with the pain of managing it and the cost of managing it. Uh, Azure can be a great place, if done right, uh, to, to leverage for disaster recovery. And I think the next three are, are a little bit more straightforward, right? Offsite backup copies. 
very table stakes, right? So if you're doing data protection on premise, a lot of times you need compliance to send data off site. Azure, can, Azure Storage can be a location for that. As well as when you're running those virtual machines in Azure, there's a need to protect them still, right? The cloud is not um, incapable of going down. And while there's redundancies, there's still the ability for data loss. And there are the abilities for, for things to happen, whether through user error or other reasons for things to go down and need to protect those. And then the last one, I'm not going to say it's not as interesting. It's just not, it's not necessarily one of my favorites, but it's, it is something that's just very obvious and, and I think everybody kind of understands is just leveraging um, the cloud as your backup target. You know, you're not doing anything on premise in terms of data protection. You're just sending data out to the cloud. So I think it's worthwhile to just kind of look at all five of these use cases and we'll dive into those in a little bit more detail. So let's start with migration and DR. And, and the reason I actually start with these two together, because you might think, well, they just seem like totally different things. Well, the processes around executing those are actually very similar. Right, in the end, you're taking an on-premise environment and you're going to replicate it. You will hopefully test to make sure things are going to work uh, once things are replicated out in the cloud when you're trying to actually make sure that things are going to spin up properly. And then, you know, it, the, where they start to, to just slightly differ is that in the migration, you're going to do a planned deployment from wherever your cloud storage location might be into the cloud compute platform, and you're going to run there and you're done. But with the DR scenario, obviously, you might face some sort of production issue. You'll do a failover. Again, that could be planned or unplanned, right? You might be trying to avoid a disaster and by doing something planned. Um, but then, of course, when the production issue is resolved, you need to be able to come back. And, and that's kind of the big difference between the two use cases. But when we think about the benefits to you, especially with the cloud, something that's very simple and affordable if done right. There are ways to do cloud implementations and not be able to take advantage of the cloud economics that folks will, will market and tell you about. Um, when we get a little bit deeper into the solutions, we'll talk a, a bit more about that. But um, naturally, uh, when we talk about, I'm um, sorry, the, the critical success factors, we'll definitely get into how you can try to really focus on doing this right and think about some things ahead of time that will allow you to really take advantage of those, uh, those savings. And self-managed. Um, this is something where ultimately Azure is, is your environment, right? It's just not your infrastructure. But you get to manage it through a web interface, control how things get set up. Uh, th there's a lot that you can do and manage here. You're just not managing that underlying infrastructure. It's, it's just the software layer at the top to be able to deploy and, and do what you need to do. A lot of people love the idea of being able to do that versus something that might be just completely managed where there are continuity-based solutions that will say, hey, listen, if you don't want to lift a finger, I'll do it all for you. And, and that's actually more of a, uh, a, a managed service versus an unmanaged service. And highly dynamic. You know, everybody kind of, I think, is starting to get an understanding for, for how much the cloud can scale, the elasticity, especially around storage and object storage in particular. Um, so the, the dynamic nature of, of the cloud and being able to, to migrate and, and leverage it for DR is, is always a great thing. So off-site backup copies. Um, getting into this one, I, I think everybody kind of understands it, so I don't have a lot of slides explaining it, right? In the end, you're just doing data protection on-premise, leveraging either maybe a physical appliance that integrates you know, the backup software, the storage, the, the monitoring and management of, of the entire solution. That can all be dropped in on-premise, and it can basically handle your backups locally, and it can send it out to the cloud, or you could be using backup software to handle it. But either way, we talk about, you know, backup copies being you have a local backup on-premise. Um, the good thing about that is on-premise you can do a lot of very fast local recoveries and have control of your data. And I think a lot of people like that. That is still, in a lot of ways, the more preferred way we see customers deploying cloud-based solutions is to kind of have that first layer of protection still on-premise. <laughs> um, and I will say, you know, there, there's a number of benefits around this, but there, there are some that you have to kind of think of with a little bit of caution, because this is where things can, can be implemented in a way that don't always work out well for you from a cost perspective or an SLA perspective. Um, but the main benefits you're going to be able to achieve here, offsite compliance, very important. You're getting audited. You've got to make sure that you have kind of a 3-2-1 rule in effect where you have your production data, your backup data, and that offsite copy in a different location outside of your environment. The cloud's a great place for that. You get that with Microsoft Azure. Infinite retention. 
Right. We just talked about the fact that storage can scale almost seemingly infinitely, and that can allow you infinite retention. Now, I don't think that necessarily everybody wants infinite retention in the cloud because there comes cost with that, obviously. You're going to pay uh, with a provider like Azure and, and most of the hyperscale cloud providers, you are going to pay for basically every gigabyte stored out there. Um, so, you know, the more retention, the more storage you use, the more you pay. So we obviously understand that most people are still going to manage retention policies, you know, at something other than infinite. But the ability to scale, I think, is a big benefit there, no matter what your needs might be. Now, this one's a little bit more interesting, backing up <clears throat> Azure Virtual Machines, right? You're now running a hybrid environment, maybe, or you're running 100% in the cloud, or you have your production machines running out there. You still need to protect them. And, and we talked a little bit of before about that, but I, I just want to reiterate, right, the, the, the cloud will provide lots of redundant copies of things based on the infrastructure, and not always, but it kind of depends on the infrastructure that you choose uh, with your cloud provider. And, and Azure will give you multiple options around your, your cloud storage that you're leveraging, whether it's virtual machine storage or even if it's the Azure blob storage that's, that's object-based, you might be, you'll be able to pay different price points to get different amounts of redundancy and varying degrees of redundancy from a data center location perspective. And that's all great, right? That helps you make sure that as you expect data to be there, if something kind of happens in one little area, you, you'll still have other copies that can kind of keep you going. That doesn't protect you from application failures. That doesn't protect you from someone going in and deleting files by accident. Um, you know, those redundant copies, the, the copies go away too. So, Backup is, is still very important for machines that are running uh, in Azure and just the cloud in general, including SaaS-based platforms. So the things that you'll be able to protect with an Azure virtual machine are the full virtual machine itself. You might just be protecting volumes, folders, and files, so you're going to get granular at more of the file system level. And then, of course, there's applications, right, SQL Server, Oracle databases, things like that, um, that folks are obviously running in there in those virtual machines. We want to be able that you can understand how your, your solution can protect at a granular level and recover at a granular level those particular objects. Now, how you do the protection is going to vary. Most folks, in terms of the solutions that are out there and in terms of what people are implementing today from what, what I've seen, is they're still putting an agent inside the virtual machine in Azure. And that's, that's pretty required in a lot of cases to get the protection of those virtual machines done. Um, it's not it's not the same as a virtual environment on-premise or a Hyper-V environment on-premise where we can kind of have control under the, at the API level and get into the infrastructure and do really cool things with those APIs to back up full virtual machines and then be able to spin them up whenever you want very instantly. Those are great things you get on-premise. Um, APIs and capabilities are being built over time around the cloud to be able to do these things but we're not seeing widespread adoption or availability of those uh, in, in, in droves at this point. So most folks are still putting an agent in the, in the guest and backing up, you know, at a server level with that agent. Um, agent list, of course, is, is that nice way of being able to do things without having to manage agents in each virtual machine. Um, typically, and, and because the, the capabilities around storage snapshots within the cloud um, are, are ultimately limited, limited around vendor support on the backup side with integration, but they're also limited in terms of capabilities at the cloud provider level, you're not often going to see, you know, a lot of robust recovery capabilities available from these in terms of granularity and things like that, or even application awareness in a lot of those cases. So predominantly, you're going to be leveraging agents in the virtual machines at this point. And the big benefits to you, as always, data loss avoidance. Right, you always want to make sure that you have backups running regularly to make sure that, you know, in, in the chance that somebody needs something and it got deleted or there was uh, an issue internally with those machines, you can obviously get that data back and make sure that your users are still happy and not angry that they, they don't have data. Uh, reduce downtime, as always, right, basic stuff. Compliance, every, you know, this is a part of, of various compliance requirements to make sure that you're doing data protection. And data mobility, um, this is a pretty interesting one. So. Backup solutions give you a secondary copy of data, but because backup solutions these days have the ability to do much more efficient transfer of data across networks and even WANs, you can start seeing data become more mobile as a result of your backup product and being protect and protecting those Azure virtual machines 
by having backups of them, you can start to do other things with them, like replicate them to another cloud provider for DR, replicate them back on premise. If you are doing a hybrid environment and you do, you know that you have a couple of machines in the cloud and you want to be able to, to make sure that you can spin those up locally if you just happen to have to do that, but you don't really want to naturally run that there on a regular basis. Um, I think that's actually a pretty interesting use case and benefit for everyone. And then lastly, in terms of the use cases, direct backup storage. Um, when I look at the, what I'm really talking about here is, you know, folks generally doing online backup. Uh, typically, you see it more in the consumer market where you, um, where you might just be, you know, sticking an agent in a machine or two and sending the backup data directly to the cloud. You're not having any on-premise backup storage at all. Um, I, I think that, you know, remote office backup, that, that's not a bad use case for that. Smaller businesses that, that are not fighting with lots of data and, and control issues and, and don't have to recover very often outside of a few files here and there, I think that works really well. Um, if you are, you know, much more of a commercial or enterprise organization and naturally you have to, you know, spin up machines pretty quickly on premise and you want to make sure you can recover quickly from outages, uh, it's typically good to make sure you have that on premise copy. Where I do think that there's a great use case and you're starting to see this more from vendors in our industry is SaaS backup. Um, being able to provide protection for applications such as Office 365. For instance, it's a great one. And having a cloud to cloud approach for those where basically the data is already residing in the cloud, the production application runs in the cloud, um, leveraging a solution that typically is SaaS based as well and can handle the data movement. Why bring all that back on premise as a part of your backup strategy and then have you manage the storage? You're now managing lots of lots more network transfer into your environment. You have to manage the copies and the compliance around that data you can actually leverage cloud storage for that and do it cloud to cloud. And I think that direct backup storage is a great use case for SaaS backup scenarios. So the big benefits to you are very obvious, offsite compliance, right? So you're still getting data offsite even though you don't have anything on site from a backup perspective and the basic backup benefits of, you know, not losing data and being able to recover. So I know I'm going quickly here, but want to make sure that you know, there's a lot to cover here. And, and this is a big part of the presentation here, critical success factors. What do you need to look out for? What are the important things to really kind of make sure you have covered when you're looking to implement a solution that's cloud-based? So I'm going to blow through these really quickly and then we'll get into the more detail. So understanding your needs, shocker, you know, rocket science, you got to understand some basic planning and needs and we'll talk about some of the things to think about. And they all lead into, you know, cloud storage strategies. There are different options around cloud storage and implementation options from your vendors that you choose are going to have an impact here. And this can have an impact on budget, cost, SLAs, all that. Um, avoiding unnecessary compute costs. Compute costs can actually be pretty, pretty impactful to a solution. And they're important sometimes. They're very useful sometimes. But you want to avoid unnecessary compute costs. Planning for a way back or a way out even. Um, it is always good to make sure that you have fail safes around leveraging cloud as well. And keeping on premises in mind. Um, I, I don't, a lot of times when, when folks will look to leverage a solution for the cloud, if you start looking for something that's purpose built there, you do need to make sure that it, it's not lacking the on premise capabilities and integration with the on premise environments that, that you really kind of love and need and are used to. You want to take care of those on premise applications because honestly, that's where things are running most of the time, unless you're, you're running fully in the cloud. So, understanding your needs, those use cases, which ones you're going after now, and which ones you think you might go after in the future, I think those are important because not every solution will cover all of them, or at least not all of them very well. Right, this is an area where, you know, it would be great to say that there's one product that can just kind of handle it all perfectly. Um, when, when there's studies out there showing that some point products still kind of exist in the environment, even though people don't always want to do that, cloud is one of the instigators of that. And that's because you just ultimately want something that can, can leverage the cloud very effectively. And not every vendor is up to speed on doing that yet. Recovery SLAs are huge. Understanding your RPOs and RTOs, especially your recovery time objectives and how fast you need to be up and running, uh, that's very, very important. That can have an impact on the type of cloud solution you use 
Um, it can have an impact on the type of, of vendor you're using to implement the cloud solution as well. So uh, be aware of that one. And budget. Everybody wishes they could have zero downtime and zero data loss. Nobody can really afford it in most cases. Um, you know, the, the cloud is going to have costs as well. It is not free infrastructure. We all know that. Um, it's, it's a movement of infrastructure costs from something that you know, is seemingly CapEx in most cases to something OpEx, something more flexible, something dynamic, something you can turn off and on. Those are the benefits there, but they're still cost, and, and obviously the budget's got to be an important part of this. Selecting the right storage strategy for the cloud. <clears throat> so I'm going to simplify because Azure has a, a number of storage offerings, and, I, and I'm really just going to simplify this from a back in the continuity perspective. You typically have your object storage, right? And Azure Blob Storage is, is, is kind of the name that they use for, for their object uh, offering. This is all, often the lowest cost option out there, very dynamic and elastic, and it, it's typically the slowest performing for most applications. You don't see a lot of applications directly running out of the object storage. You can, and some do, but you don't see that in most cases, especially for critical systems. Um, so while it's still performing, the low cost, those are the trade-offs you typically get with storage and with just about anything, right? The premium stuff that works really fast costs more. And that's the block or the VM hard disk storage that you get out of the Azure virtual machine area. So in the Azure Compute Cloud, you'll actually have virtual machines running and they'll have, you know, virtual hard disks uh, connected to those. And those are block-based. You can get ones that are SSD-based under the hood and you can pay for, you know, various SLA and performance levels. Um, so these are definitely going to be the highest perform performing. They're, they're still pretty dynamic and still pretty flexible and still allows you to scale quite a bit, um, but there are limits. Um, for instance, I, I think these days, and again, this is something that changes quite often, but I think the most, uh, the most you can connect to a single virtual machine is 64 uh, hard disks, and, and I think they're still capped at a terabyte in size um, for scalability. So, best you're going to get for one machine is, is about 64 terabytes, unless that's changed in recently, and I, and I missed that. Um, so this naturally, you know, tends to cost more. So using these options are going to be necessary for your continuity strategy. It's really important to take these dynamics into account, right? Are you planning on accessing this, and do you need this storage accessible for very fast recovery times, um, instantly accessible to applications running in the cloud, and all that good stuff, you might actually want to leverage something that, you know, lives in the Azure Compute Cloud and leverages block storage. Um, and you get other benefits for that as well. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some of those uh, a little bit later. But, um, again, this is going to have big impacts on costs and, and important to kind of understand, you know, how, how much, how fast you need storage access based on your continuity solution. <laughs> Avoiding unnecessary compute costs. This is really big, and I have, a, I have a pretty cool way of showing this a little bit later that should help folks understand that, you know, this can ultimately run up to 70% or more of your total solution cost if this is done wrong. This is an area that you want to be careful of. Um, now, it's sometimes necessary, though. If you have really stringent SLAs, you need to recover very fast. Um, it, it's often, and you need enterprise capability around WAN transfer, like WAN acceleration, global deduplication, et cetera if you need more predictable recovery time objectives where you have kind of warm standbys or hot standbys living in the Azure Compute Cloud, that's when you need to use this. And it does have, it does have merit in a, lot of, in a lot of cases, but um, there are ways to unnecessarily use it, and, and we'll talk about those. Planning for a way back, always think it's important to make sure that whatever your solution is, they have a, a solid means to be able to bring the data back, whether it's through its own interface, uh, a reverse seeding process, whatever that might be, you want to make sure that, that things can come back. And, and ultimately, if you get the right solution, it should be able to come back very easily. And keeping on-premises in mind, this is where, you know, some solutions, if you're looking at something that's a point product that's cloud-based, just make sure that you're still getting application consistency. Things are integrating with, you know, uh, your, your hypervisor APIs the way that you really want them to be integrated with and following the best practices. Um, I see a lot of solutions out there that are 100% agent-based that have great cloud integration, but you know, on-premise to have to manage an agent for every virtual machine that's out there um, is, is more of an antiquated approach of doing things. You know, agents are good sometimes. You don't want to have to do it all the time in your environment. Um, and of course, things that can help you get local continuity 
uh, and leverage the advanced capabilities for instant recovery across physical and virtual machines, things like that are always important, and centralized management as well. I haven't run into too many people that, uh, that don't want to make sure that they can, they can manage their on-premise and their, their cloud environments in one user interface. So we'll talk a little bit about how Unitrends can help, and, and we'll wrap up here. On the cloud migration and disaster recovery side of things, we have a product called Boomerang that specifically handles VMware-based migration to Azure, um, supports AWS as well, but Azure is something new that we, we invested in heavily uh, just this year and seeing great uptick at this point with the Azure market, of course. And, and for both migration and VR, because we talked about those use cases being pretty similar, uh, Boomerang really just captures that VMware environment using its best practices, sends it to very low-cost cloud storage, uh, you know, in, in the Azure Blob area. It doesn't use any compute unnecessarily, and it only uses it when you need to, to spin up out there for a migration or a failover. So it'll handle the migration piece as well as the, the failover into the cloud, and the beauty of it is it also helps everything come back from the cloud. And I think this is, this is one of those purpose-built tools that does keep in mind the on-premise capabilities, even though, it, bear in mind, it's limited to VMware only at this point but it's got great VMware integration, uses all the best practices, but it does that replication to the low-cost storage. It remodels the VMs and the networking information as well as the VM configuration to make sure that what we spin up in the cloud as closely resembles your production environment as possible. Doesn't use any cloud compute whatsoever out there during that process, but when you do need to fail over, that's entirely automated, even the boot orders and everything, and it literally is one click. And I, I'm not kidding you, uh, the, the intelligent defaults allow that. There's a lot of power in your customization, but it is one click to be able to fail over and one click to come back. And, and in the end, when it comes back, it can automate everything to bring, make sure that what was running and failed over in Azure can be captured, brought back into your VMware environment, and is now running and available in VMware. It does all of that for you. So this is one of the more elegant solutions out there, especially around fail back. Um, but it is specific to VMware environments. And I always love showing something like this because it, this just ultimately shows an example of a technology we call the approach pilot light, but really it's, it's all about not using compute, right? So you, you're, you're not leveraging any kind of compute in the cloud until you really need it. And, you know, the pilot light's there kind of handling the replication, and if you have to fail over, then boom, you start it all. Um, just taking a look at the impact, I mentioned 70 plus percent. These are the numbers behind that. So if I look at being able to protect 5, 10, 25, 50, 100 virtual machines on premise and using a DR strategy in Azure, if I have to run one virtual machine out there, and, and the reason I use this particular example is we have a competitor that requires, and they say just one, but depending on how you scale, it could be more, um, but they require you to have a virtual machine out there to manage metadata and journaling and things like that. And that gets to be very costly, depending on the size of your solution. That one, v that one VM can start to be 70 plus percent of your overall solution that you've implemented. And that includes the, the license cost of, of your solution. I use Boomerang as a benchmark here. Um, but then the compute, the cloud storage, and, and there's your total budget. The, the compute can be, can be huge when when it's used unnecessarily. And Boomerang does not require any compute for the replication process. So I think that's a big differentiator. Cost is a huge differentiator for this, really on the, on the overall value of TCO because of how it uses the cloud so economically, uh, pilot light being a, a big part of that. All the one-click failover fail back is a huge differentiator, especially coming back and the fact that it's agentless and integrates with virtual environments in the best practice methodologies is, is also you know, very, very important for for any product, and I think, uh, again, you see a lot of agent-based solutions um, in, in this space today, and, and this is where I think Boomerang kind of sets itself apart from an ease-of-use perspective. Um, pricing, you know, very, very affordable, $20 per VM per month. Um, so ultimately, you can get fully implemented, implemented DR for less than $33 a month, leveraging Azure with this product. Uh, it's not always gonna be ideal, um, and there are just some limitations to overall solutions and, and cloud-based continuity. So, for instance, uh, if I have virtual machine disks on-premise that are greater than a terabyte, I'll have to either reconfigure those or, or ultimately I won't be able to leverage Azure because of the one terabyte limit that, that's in the VHDs in the cloud. 
Um, there's obviously, you know, VMware's been around a very long time and, and supports many operating systems. You could be running some older operating systems that won't run in the cloud. You want to audit that, upgrade those so you can leverage the cloud. If you can't upgrade them, then this may not be the right solution for you. Um, again, it's, it's agentless, so if you do need agent-based capabilities to take advantage of capturing data for physical machines or even some virtual machines that can't do snapshots, um, Boomerang has, a lim has some limitations here. And if you require, this is an important one, if you require consistent, predictable SLAs around recovery, then, then you do need to consider that there might be other purpose-built solutions out there to handle that. And the reason I say that is, and this is not a knock against Azure or anyone in particular, but the hyperscale clouds, Azure being one of them, to give you such great elasticity and cost-effectiveness, it's a shared infrastructure, right? You could pay more to get more dedicated infrastructure, but to leverage a product like Boomerang, Boomerang is going to basically use APIs of Microsoft's to import data from the blob storage into the compute platform. And, and while we've actually tested this against Amazon and seen Azure perform much better, which is great on the Azure side when you compare that to Amazon, it's still also something that you can't say is going to be the same each time and is going to meet a certain window. You just can't. Um, you can benchmark and make sure you're comfortable with it, but for someone to say what you know, Microsoft's not going to say, if you're not up and running in an hour, I'll give you money back. They're just not going to do it. And, and Unitrends won't do it either when we're leveraging uh, Azure on the back end. So if you require an SLA on that, um, then, then again, these types of solutions may not be perfect for you. And that's where, you know, Unitrend does have another offering that is purpose-built for these types of gaps and, and provides a little bit more of a, a continuity-specific cloud. And, and this isn't a marketing pitch of Unitrend's cloud versus Azure because a lot of folks have a preference, right? They, they want to be able to leverage the cloud provider of their choice and we give you that option. Um, what I'm trying to do is just educate on the fact that there are certain things that you may not be able to leverage right away. We're working on closing those gaps, of course, whether they're in our technology and obviously um, on, on the cloud side, if there are some limitations in scalability and things like that or operating systems, you know Microsoft is, is ramping those things up quickly. Um, but Unitrends has some other ways to be able to close those gaps if you happen to fall into one of those gaps and can't work around them. And, and that's kind of the only key message there. So I'll say backup copies and backing up Azure VMs. So we have a product called Unitrends Backup that will deploy from the Azure Marketplace into the Azure environment. So it will actually use compute, it will use the, the block storage. And this is the, the software that can basically live out there and put agents on your virtual machines and protect them. Um, or for offsite backup copies, like you see in this particular use case, uh, it's all Microsoft certified. We've gone through all the process with them and that was great. Uh, so excellent to be able to make sure that we have a joint solution that's fully supported and certified. Uh, but you can now basically leverage an on-premise recovery series backup appliance that we can sell or our backup software, do backups on-premise, replicate those backups or copy them uh, out into the Azure uh, instance. And because we are running in the compute platform, you do get those benefits we talked about before, right? Be aware of cost. If the cost model doesn't fit for you, then, then it's not the right solution for you. But it also does cap provide great data reduction capabilities because we have compute running out there where we can do global inline deduplication, WAN acceleration, harden the network connection. Um, so it's great for, for larger data transfers and, and the extra cost you pay on the cloud storage side can often be mitigated or even eliminated compared to the object storage based on the deduplication rates. But you do have the compute cost that, that goes along with it. And similar story, so we will run out there and be able to put um, uh, agents on the Azure virtual machines if you have them running your production machines in Azure. And one of the things I think that's worth adding here is that once we have the data basically on our backup storage uh, that lives in Azure as a virtual machine, we can do everything with it that we normally do. Right? This can all obviously be centralized uh, in terms of management if you have on-premise instances of the product in a hybrid scenario. But if you want to replicate the data, and leverage an on-premise environment for DR, you can if you want to let, replicate the data out to the Unitrends cloud and you want to do one-hour SLA failover uh, of, of the machines that are in the cloud and, and get that additional resilience 
Uh, it's just like anything else. You need to have a DR plan for production machines. Uh, you can get that leveraging the Unitrans products. And as I mentioned, this is obviously something that's available today through the Azure Marketplace. And direct backup storage really comes into that SaaS-based use case. So for Office 365, um, there's still ways to lose data, emails, all that stuff gets deleted, you know, manually by folks uh, as well as SharePoint and OneDrive data. So retention is not unlimited. That's built into the Microsoft packages. Um, there are some advanced packages you can get for Office 365 that add more retention and even add archiving. Those still don't necessarily prevent you from someone deleting the data. If I delete the archive or I delete something from a while ago, it's gone. All right, so backup is still very important, even over top of the existing capabilities that are within Office 365. And, uh, and ultimately, we think, you know, there's a, there's a better way of doing this than just leveraging an on-premise piece of software or appliance to handle integrating with your SaaS. Uh, we think, basically, uh, we, we have a service also lives in the Microsoft Cloud, connects right into the Office 365 account, so, and it backs up to Azure Storage. So it's not causing any undue load on your network. Um, it's not causing any undue load on the, the cloud environment because obviously that's well managed by, by Microsoft. Um, there's nothing to install. There's nothing for you to manage on the backup side. We'll do six snapshots every day. And basically you get a self-service uh, interface to be able to do any kind of granular recoveries you need for your end users. So really cool offering there that I think is, is helpful. So what do you do next? I think remember the five use cases, figure out which ones uh, are important to you. If you're already evaluating, great. Um, you know, take a look at the, the vendors that you think are going to meet those use cases, and hopefully this helps you. Five critical success factors, don't forget those. These involve a lot of planning and prevent you from overspending in the cloud. And then lastly, if you, if you liked what you heard and you think we have good solutions for, for what you're trying to do, visit our website. We have uh, free trials available for everything or demos available for everything we talked about today. And we can certainly get on the phone and help you for, for anything that you need. And it is the end of year, so I do need to do a shameless plug on, on promos that you probably see from every vendor. But we do have uh, physical backup appliances that integrate with all this Azure capability that we talked about today. And uh, we have a phenomenal promo right now going on where you can save up to 64K. And we have very small appliances for small businesses, so don't let the 64K number make you think that it's always going to be a high, heavy price tag. We actually range from a terabyte and a thousand dollars or so to 200 terabytes almost in our appliances. So uh, a heavy range to be able to, uh, to scale for your needs. And that's it. Sorry, I think I went over my time a little bit here, but uh, a lot of information to cover. And uh, Kevin, I think we can get into the Q&A. Excellent, Joe, sounds good. Why don't we get started here? Uh, first question is, how does Unitrends offer a one hour SLA, but you can't do it in Azure? It's a good question, um, really good question. I, and I only touched on it a little bit um, on the infrastructure side of Azure. And, and I'm not an Azure architect, but the, the, the end result is obviously there's a, a lot of folks sharing that infrastructure and, and it's often not necessarily dedicated for you. And again, they do have capabilities to start dedicating more, um, but being able to guarantee a recovery time in Azure, again, Microsoft's not gonna give you that SLA and your vendor's not gonna give you that SLA, uh, your backup vendor's not gonna give you that SLA. We do offer the SLA for the Unitrends cloud because we do operate and manage that cloud. It is not a replacement for Azure in general. It's just a purpose-built cloud specific for offsite long-term retention and, and DR where you need that SLA, it's one hour. We leverage, because we can control and manage the infrastructure, we can integrate further with the APIs there to do things like instant recovery and it'll cover physical and virtual machines, lots and lots of operating systems. So the things that I mentioned about Boomerang, all a little short with Azure, we, we plug those gaps here. Um, but again, the, um, the, the Azure component of the things as you look at DR solutions, that's where the cost and budget play come in here. You know, how important is the SLA to you versus how, how big is your budget? I just mentioned Boomerang can do under $33 a month for a particular for one VM to give you full DR capabilities with Azure, that's staggering in comparison to purpose-built uh, offerings. So the purpose-built solutions, I think, give you extra enterprise capabilities, extra extra coverage, maybe a little extra confidence because we're willing to kind of put an SLA on it. But at the same time, um, you know, I think both are awesome solutions that are ultimately going to meet 
various people's needs. So that's why we're just drawing some awareness to it all here. Okay, thanks, Joe. Uh, next question, let's jump into Jeremy has a couple of questions. How does your DR account for poor or low bandwidth? So all of our products are able to handle um, bandwidth throttling naturally. And, and for our enterprise backup products, and obviously band, bandwidth throttling is important to be able to you know, control how much of that pipe we're going to use, especially if it's a small pipe. Um, another component to this is when you leverage, so Boomerang does not use compute in the cloud. So Boomerang does not have all the advanced WAN acceleration capabilities and things like that available because it doesn't have that other kind of compute running in the cloud to connect to the on-premise component. Unitrend's backup does. And, and this could be one of the areas where it's, it's more important, even for someone who, who has, you know, lesser infrastructure with smaller, with, with less bandwidth because of where they live and where they're located in, 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 from a geography perspective, um, you, you may need to go for a more premium offering like Unitrend's backup to get data out into Azure because it can handle the hardening of the network connection. It does UDP netting and things like that and creates a nice stable, secure connection between the two instances of our software. And, and that can be a big help there for the, not only giving you throttling, which it does, but also giving you that extra hardening and wet acceleration capabilities. Okay, uh, the next question is, from a network perspective, can we monitor Azure with our on-premise solutions like SolarWinds? So our products are not network monitoring. Um, we wouldn't compete with SolarWinds uh, in any way in that, in that sense. Um, what we obviously do is we do leverage, and, and I, you know what, I think this could come from a point where I talked about our, our recovery series appliances and I mentioned how monitoring and management are, are part of that solution. And what I'm referring to there is, is if you buy a recovery series appliance from us, the hardware, the software, the OS layer, the security, that's all built in, and, and even our support team can monitor the hardware itself for disk drive failures and other issues and proactively support you on those things. Um, so if I misled you when I said monitoring, that's really what I meant, is being able to kind of monitor that part of the solution. But externally around the network, um, uh, you, you would definitely still need something like a solar lens to handle that. Okay. Next question, Brian is asking, at some point, can you address transaction costs when implementing VMDR, are there costs for each file write or for failback fail outgoing reads? So, so great question. This is, <laughs> you get into some of the uh, very, very detailed uh, complexities of cloud-based utility pricing. Um, I actually think, and, and I'm not gonna be the expert on this, and, and there's, there hopefully are some Microsoft folks here that, that'll hear this and, and we can make sure that we, we look it up, we get you the answer properly. But um, Azure actually does a better job than other cloud vendors, especially Amazon, from nitpicking little tiny charges around bandwidth and things like that. Um, I, I won't say that it's all 100% free just because I don't I don't have the pricing memorized. But, um, but Unitrends is obviously going to, if you're bringing data back and you're doing recoveries, um, you, you will be faced, you know, typically with charges from most providers, although I think, again, Azure is a little bit more friendly with those coming out. Um, but there are bandwidth charges associated in some cases uh, within the cloud itself. Um, Boomerang, I, still, because of the way it leverages the cloud, is going to give you, again, the lowest cost option in terms of, you know, transactions, how it's processed, and the amount of storage used, and the amount of compute used, and, and bandwidth as well. I think that, um, that Boomerang does great, and you don't get charged for bandwidth into the cloud, so so that's that's good there because it doesn't have you know some of the network efficiencies we mentioned. Um, but definitely, I, I can't demystify for you all the aspects of the utility pricing there. But I do think Azure is in a, is more competitive in a lot of cases there. Um, the Unitrends cloud, because it's purpose built, we do kind of have more of an all-in-one price. Uh, so, so you don't pay for, for bandwidth charges and things like that. And again, that's not the position of Unitrends Cloud. It's just more or less to give you an idea of the various options you have around continuity and cloud. I think Azure does a great job on the hyperscale side to make it simpler. Um, and, and we have an option that, that's geared just towards this particular use case. So you typically just pay by the amount of data, and that's about it. But um, hopefully that long-winded answer helps you a little bit, but I think you're going to have to dig in a little bit more with Microsoft on some of the specific charges. 
Okay, and there's a there's a few questions on kind of what we can back up. So first one is, can we back up Nutanix? Is there any limitations? Great question. Uh, no limitations there. Um, actually, we have a pretty good story with Nutanix, mainly because Nutanix is hyper-converged and it's bringing servers, storage, operating systems all together for you um, and making it simple. We do the same thing on backup. We can put a box in there that brings everything together from a backup stack perspective and, and provide that in one, one vendor, one interface, one support call. Uh, we support natively at the API level all three major hypervisors Nutanix supports, which is uh, the MR Hyper-V and Citrix Zen Server. Zen Server is a, a bit of a differentiator for us. You don't see a lot of vendors really integrating with it. Uh, and they have their own with Acropolis, which is pretty popular and growing in popularity. And we can support that today with agents. And we're, we're working on integration for next year. And, and we're actually very close to finishing up our Nutanix Ready certification. Okay, and then there's a couple of questions about Boomerang, about what it supports. Is it just VMware right now, or is it VMware plus others? So right now, Boomerang is purpose-built for VMware to Azure. Um, also supports Amazon, but that's a foregone conclusion here. We're, we're, we're here to focus on Azure, obviously, but just for awareness. Okay, Esther has a question. From a compliance standpoint, what is the difference between the Amazon and Unitrends cloud solutions. Do both or either comply with specific regu regulatory frameworks such as SOX, NISTA, or HIPAA? Uh, and, and was the question around Amazon or Azure? Uh, Amazon and Unitrends. Amazon. Okay. So, so uh, I can I'll get more aggressive here. Um, with that, with Amazon, ultimately. Uh, Listen, big hyperscale providers like Amazon and, and you saw, I, I think Azure has the most certifications in the world when it comes to this, so, so they're, they're phenomenal. Um, Amazon also has many. Unitrends Cloud has a ton of certifications around SOC2 and things like that as well. Um, our certifications are going to be much more focused around continuity. SOX is a big part of that where we help people become SOX compliant as a result of our solution. So um, we have all of our certifications listed on the on the Unitrend site as well. So uh, we we don't run into folks saying I'd I'd rather do DR with Amazon over you guys because we feel like Amazon's more secure. We we typically have folks tell us we'd rather do DR with Unitrend's cloud because it offers more enterprise capabilities than Amazon. Um, and and a lot of that is it really is because Amazon is is. Not not as easy to develop the solutions for as, as Azure is, and of course, when we control our own infrastructure with our Unitrends cloud, we, we can do what we want with our stuff. Okay. Let's see. Next question. How much is Unitrends going to tie into the new partnership? with Microsoft and Citrix for virtual data centers? I wish I had a good answer to understand that. I know that Unitrends has a Citrix Ready partnership, and Unitrends is uh, certified with Microsoft for the Azure Marketplace, so we have both of those covered pretty well. It, it really depends, I think, on the use case that you're thinking of for how we might do something different or additive to that. I'm not sure we need to. Um, love to take that one offline because I think you stumped me a little bit on, on how we can take advantage of it, but uh, hopefully my answer gives you a little idea of what we do with both vendors because um, we, we should give a lot of confidence to folks in the fact that we, we are basically ready with both of those partners. Okay. Next question is, if I need a multi-cloud strategy, do you have solutions for OpenStack in AWS? Um, so, so Boomerang supports AWS. Um, our Unitrends backup software can can run in Azure today. AWS will, will be available later in the year. We we chose Azure first uh, because of our partnership with Microsoft, and we believe the adoption has been so big in our base that it was the first one we chose. Um, but we do have similar solutions available for AWS. OpenStack, on the other hand, um, at this point, we're we're waiting more on the demand around OpenStack before we are able to, to do more investment there. Um, we have a lot of capabilities that can protect uh, certain aspects of OpenStack environments, but uh, I wouldn't go and say that, you know, we have nearly the capabilities that we've talked about today with Badger. Okay. And then last question before we wrap up. If I have a, 
a production VMs in Azure, can I replicate them back to my own data center for DR? Yes, yeah, I, I barely touched on that one, but it's a great, great call for a use case. Um, once uh, once our software is running out there, it can do the, the typical things our software can do, and naturally when it backs up Azure Virtual Machines, it has the capability to, to send those backups to other locations to make sure that you're compliant with off-site capabilities, and your off-site could be back on-premise if you wanted it to be. Okay. I think that's just about it. We're just about bumping up here against the top of the hour. I wanted to thank everybody for joining us today, and as a reminder, you will get a, an email after the webinar with a link to the on-demand version as well as some additional resources, and we'll also contact the $100 Amazon gift card winner via email. Thanks again, everybody, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.